Okay, say something, let's see how we sound. Ah, uh, um, mm, olive oil, extra virgin, just like me. Welcome back to Ralph World. I'm Uncle Britt, and with me as always is... Mac. And today, we are on our next episode of our Doctor Who journey, and one I am very, very excited for because this is my personal favorite Doctor, Eleven, Matt Smith. Oh. And remember, most importantly, fezzes are cool. For me, Eleven, and I know we've talked about this many times off camera, is... I could not stand Eleven at first, and I'm not even sure it's that I couldn't stand Eleven so much as I couldn't stand Matt Smith. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people, I'll freely admit, I got so wrapped up in Tennant because up until a certain point, like Tennant was my doctor, mm -hmm. was my favorite doctor, and just like I think we've talked about in previous episodes, just that the idea of a fan getting into the mindset of, what do you mean somebody else is playing this role? Mm -hmm. Nobody else could play this role. I actually became trapped in that. And I don't think, honestly, I don't think I watched any of um, Smith's episodes until one day I was off work and I was at home and BBC America was doing one of their, like, three-day Doctor mm -hmm. Who marathons. I think that's the first time I ever actually watched him after I calmed down and realized some of this is pretty good. I do remember when I was watching it through the first time and I started talking about the Pandorica, that whole like arc in there, you hated it. I, yeah. I, I remember every time I'd start talking about it, you would groan. And now, honestly, I think it's one of my favorite uh, Matt Dude. Smith story arcs. I think the Pandorica story arc was fantastic. It brought back Rory. It started like, it, and I I liked how, I mean, we're we're really jumping ahead in mm. this, but like I did like how even the beginning of the first episode like touched on mm. almost everyone. Like even um, Van Gogh was mm. in it again with his painting. Yes, yes. With the TARDIS exploding. Mm -hmm. I was like, this, like, how they pieced this all together. And then, and then River was Cleopatra. Oh, well, I mean, that just makes sense. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. But, yeah, Matt Smith during the Pandorica thing and the second Big Bang and all that crap, I thought it was so cool because, it, for me at least, it didn't feel like Matt Smith's doctor was the center of everything that was going on. It felt like it was more focused around Amy, Rory, and River, and them going through everything. And the Doctor was almost struggling to keep up, because he was constantly back, and jumping back and forth, back and forth, ultimately to find out they were doing that on purpose to get him into the box. But mm -hmm. I digress. No, I think you're right. I do think you're right, because even looking back on it, I think I had that vibe, that feeling that as long as um, Amy and Rory were there, that it was really mainly focused on that relationship. And then, I mean, later, after a good doctor goes mm -hmm. to war, we found out why, because yes. that whole family dynamic, like they were building mm -hmm. up to that. And then like, it's like, whatever happened before that didn't like really make you wonder mm -hmm. but then it's like everything that happened before that all of a sudden clicked mm -hmm. it's like that's why this happened that's why this happened that's why river said this like it, it all fit in together but i would be chagrin if i didn't talk about his regeneration I was in, say, into the 11th not yeah, out i was going to say yeah we have to start with we have to start with the regeneration <laughs> And before you get to your guy, mm -hmm. this was the last hurrah for my first guy, for mm -hmm. David Tennant. And he was so alone when he regenerated. And those words, I don't want to go. Like, and that was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that was another reason that, like, I was, like, his out was so heartbreaking and so emotional. And then... Smith came in and is eating fish sticks and custard, mm -hmm. and I'm like, defiler. Yeah, you one know? of the first thing he says is, I have legs. I have legs. Yeah. Which is kind of a dumb thing to say. Because I, every doc, what doctor has not had legs? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I mean, Tennant did do the teeth thing, but... But he said new teeth. Yes. He didn't say, I have teeth. He said, <laughs> I have new teeth. But yeah, I think I think that was another, another issue mm. that led into my disdain, my initial disdain for Matt Smith. And keep in mind, like... I have no problem with Matt Smith now. So, like, this episode isn't going to be me bagging on Matt Smith. Like, I've come around. <laughs> and he is my favorite, but I, yeah. I'll still criticize. Um, he's not, no one's above that. Like, I think, you know, Matt Smith's Moffat era, uh, or I should say Moffat's Matt Smith era, I thought a lot of the smaller episodes were kind of weak if it didn't serve the bigger arcs. I agree. He was not good with filler episodes. Yeah. yeah. And not to say they were all bad, but it, it definitely, like, the attention, I don't want to say the budget, but, like, the extra effort was put into the episodes that serve the main plot forward. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think even now, when I watch it, that is one major criticism that I have, is that it seems like... Every episode was working towards, like, a, a, how, how do I want to phrase this? Like, I'm not saying that, like, having that whole meta arc, mm -hmm. especially through um, the story arc when Amy was the companion, is bad. But it's just, like, everything was always moving forward. Everything, like, there was always, like, this tension mm -hmm. almost to the episodes that like there was never really one where you could just sit back and have sort of like a monster of the week type episode mm -hmm. and to your point you're absolutely right when you did have those episodes they were really weak and again not all of them because like the doctor the witch and the wardrobe i think it's called i thought that episode was fantastic that yeah. was real good but wasn't that a christmas special oh, I, I don't that know was, yeah, i think that was a christmas special yeah but I thought that was really good. It was a solo Smith one. Mm -hmm. uh, Very emotional at the end. Mm -hmm. Very emotional at the end. But once we get past the regeneration, the TARDIS were getting... Like, Matt Smith really just got all new when he came in. Because mm -hmm. it was a new doctor, obviously. Mm -hmm. New pen, new uh, Sonic, new companions. There wasn't a lot of holdover from Tenet. New TARDIS? Because mm -hmm. that was like the whole... Um, reason why he left mm -hmm. in the in the first landing because he had to go fix the TARDIS and if I had one criticism of 10 and this is a similar criticism that I'll have of 13 <laughs> that I'll have of 13 is the interior of the TARDIS was really meh like when you got to um, Smith's TARDIS the inside of that TARDIS was very much the inside of his head. Mm -hmm. It was disconnected. It was a mess. There mm -hmm. was like things. He's things were just on it. Yeah, things were just slapped together. I swear, one of his control panels was like an old 1950s yep. typewriter. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So like, I really dug his TARDIS, mm -hmm. and I think that was the first time where like I really wanted to spend more time in the TARDIS because they had those different levels and mm -hmm. everything. Whereas, like, with Tenants, it was just basically, like, rock formations with, mm -hmm. the, um, with the control panel in the middle. And I thought the control console was cool because I feel like Ten's control console was almost a throwback in design to the first Doctor. Mm -hmm. But, like, other than that, the interior, that doesn't really feel like they, they put much into that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, when we got to Smith's, the art department just had a blast going to town on that thing. To, to today, I would say that Matt Smith's TARDIS is my favorite. Like it just, like you said, it it was, it kind of looked like it was all thrown together. Yeah. He would pull panels off and just start working with wires. And yeah. Just kind of leave it like that. Yeah. So it kind of had this feeling that it was always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I just really dug that because. It kind of gave the doctor something to do every time he was by himself in the TARDIS, which was always working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I that TARD that design helped me fully understand the concept of the TARDIS because it really showed the multiple levels. It showed the multiple mm -hmm. levels. It gave them more room to play around in, and part of me wonders if they did that because they knew there was going to be more people in the TARDIS mm -hmm. at a time. Because you figure 
once he had the, both companions mm -hmm. of Amy and Rory, then you throw River in that there's a potential for four people in mm -hmm. there at any given time. And if you would have had an old style, an old version of the TARDIS like Tenants, that's very flat. Mm -hmm. At least with what they did, like you said, there were levels and there were stairs and there were places that people could like hang out. They could just be staged mm -hmm. in it. Um, and also, it you very much. I feel like even though it was true with all the TARDISes, I feel like Smith's was also the one where you felt like, yeah, this thing just goes on forever. Mm -hmm. There's like all of these other compartments, because they've even, they even referenced them oh, yeah. in episodes, like I'm going down to this deck mm -hmm. or I'm going to that deck. And like, I- We're I, gonna go into the pool. Yeah, I dug that, that like, even though the camera never mm -hmm. really left the control room, there was always this feeling that it was much bigger and it ended up working into the plot of Amy's whole family dynamic and how River yeah. is part Time Lord because they just spent so much time in the TARDIS. Yeah. And you can only really do that if there's a lot of room. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of had to create the baby <laughs> in the TARDIS. <laughs> and the doctor couldn't just be like on the other side of the wall. Hey, you don't know what their jam is, man. You're right. They everyone does seem to have an unhealthy relationship with the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Which Not bring nine. which brings us to let's talk about the companions first. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I have one gripe before we dive into it. Oh, okay. I like Amy as a companion. I really do. Okay. I liked her and Roy together. Liked them both. I loved Rory and the Doctor's relationship when it came to Amy. Yes. But I did not like that Amy got her own intro. What do you mean her own intro? Like, instead of the Doctor Who theme and all that, like, it was Amy's narration at the start of, like, the whole first season was her talking about how she was the girl that waited and that's the Doctor and then it cuts to the theme song. I hated it. Because it made it seem like it was about Amy and the Doctor was just there. Well, we just talked about that. It kind of was about Amy. Yeah. And that's that's a gripe. Like, that's okay. what I'm saying. Like, I didn't like that she also got the intro, uh, including how much it was centered around her for a while. Well, didn't they kind of do the same thing with uh, Jenna later? Coleman? Uh, Clara? Whatever you want to call impossible her. Impossible girl? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Okay. I remember her and Peter, like, falling in the intro, but I don't remember her having, like, a whole narration and story bit about her. Well, no, I'm even talking about once she became companion for Smith. I, I'd i have to look at there it. There was I, the whole impossible girl thing. When, we're jumping way ahead. We'll get to that episode in a second. <laughs> but I'm very glad that, like, when the first episode of um, Smith's run aired mm -hmm. okay you know how i can be no i can be very short don't don't say that okay so when he fell to the earth and he started eating fish sticks and custard and he's talking to this little girl i got maybe five minutes into it before i said this is crap and i turned it off okay <laughs> wow you really just missed all of their chemistry and charm for me <laughs> but i'm glad i did because mm -hmm. later after i got over it when i saw the result of that first episode i didn't know grown-up amy was mm -hmm. a grown-up of amy was amelia mm -hmm. so like when he's yelling at her and she says why did you say five minutes even i was like <gasps> mm -hmm. dude Amy, I, I just straight up felt so bad for her. Yeah, Because yeah. that first episode, that's really the introduction to Matt Smith. Yeah. Ends up being, like, a consistent life-altering issue for Amy. Like, she doesn't trust people. She just... Everyone was out to get her because they thought she was insane. Everybody thought it was, like, an imaginary mm -hmm. friend or something. And she was keeping this journal. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it... it drawings of him mm -hmm. yeah hanging them all around she even made art projects with it and everything of the tardis and whatnot like if you have no proof and the entity that you just met said hey i'll be back in five minutes and then you literally never see hear yeah. about experience anything about them again yeah. i'd feel like i was insane oh yeah so when he does show up 
which is also wild to think that he looked exactly the same, that I... I don't blame her for knocking him yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Like, if there's one thing for sure, the doctor doesn't always get it right and often, <laughs> often leaves people alone for 15 years. <laughs> No, but I I did I did like that. Like I felt mm-hmm. for her immediately when she said that. And that was a very I felt interesting introduction to to the um the companion. Mm-hmm. Because when it started with her narrating and you hear this woman's voice, mm-hmm. you don't expect it's going mm-hmm. to be this kid. You think this kid is just like a um just like a side mm-hmm. thing that happens, like what do, like what tends to happen with mm-hmm. the doctor sometimes, and just like finding out that was really her, I thought that was really cool. I really liked the intro. Um, I still wasn't real keen on Rory when they first introduced him, but honestly, I don't think we were supposed to be yeah. at the time because like he just sort of faded away mm-hmm. for like half a season, and then he would sporadically come back, and then he was Roman. <laughs> yeah, and then he was Roman. <laughs> But Amy, despite my feelings towards Smith, and even after I appreciated him, liked Mm -hmm. Eleven, um, and Ten and then Twelve were my two favorites, I think Amy has always been my favorite companion, oddly enough, even though like I wasn't real... It's worth pointing out, audience, uh, he loves redheads that has nothing to do with it not at all but i i just liked how she was um much more involved in what was going Mm -hmm. on she was much more proactive in what was going on in that one episode where she got left behind and then they had to go back in time and there were two amy's and meanwhile she like had made her own armor Mm -hmm. was whipping around a katana and it was like She's like Fallout Amy. Mm-hmm. Like the whole, like her whole character, just like her God, motivations, her strength. Heartbreaking episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, I really liked, and she got him to do things. Like she was the motivation mm-hmm. for him for a lot of stuff in the first season. Um, and she wasn't afraid to talk to him the way that she did. If he was being an idiot, mm-hmm. she'd tell him. She was she was kind of also like the prototype or the archetype later for Clara and the way that Clara talked to him. Because I don't remember, like, I don't even think Donna really had the same type of relationship with Tennant. But then again, Tennant wasn't nearly as they were, absent-minded yeah. as Eleven. Donna and Tennant were kind of, I say Tennant, Donna yeah, and the Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Those two kind of had... Best friend chemistry. Yeah, like they built each other up, even if it at times was very exaggerated. Mm-hmm. While Clara and Amy would more so just call the doctor out. I feel like Amy and the doctor, putting aside Amy's crush, mm-hmm. Amy and the doctor was very much more like siblings. Mm-hmm. Especially after the marriage, when like you knew there was nothing that was going to happen between them. You know what I mean? Like, she was very much crushing on him at mm-hmm. first. Um, but I think it was just like this, obs- I don't want to say obsession, but just like this in the back of the mm-hmm. of her mind, like, who is this guy? You know, things like that. But her, she always loved Rory. Mm-hmm. Like, the doctor may be endangered, but she will choose Rory yeah. in the same situation. Like, mm-hmm. it may be a crush, it may be a fling, it may just be like, mystery man, I want to know what's going on. Yeah. But at the end of the day, she knows she wants to be with Rory. Mm-hmm. And my God, does it show for some of the things that they go through together. I know, I know. Like, even in the episode you were just talking about when she made armor and everything, if I recall, Rory even had this big deal of like, we're not killing either one of them, they both need to survive, they're both Amy. Yeah. He was definitely, he was absolutely trying to save both of them. And I felt one of the things, because there was a lot of heartbreak about that episode, but one of the things that I felt especially bad about was the doctor was the one that made the decision without telling Rory. Mm -hmm. And I always hated that Amy, the one that got left behind, 
may have had that last inkling thought that Rory lied to her. Mm-hmm. Because he, as far as he was concerned, he didn't. Because mm-hmm. he even went off on the doctor, I think, at one point when the doctor was, when he realized mm-hmm. what was happening. Yeah, it, and it, it's funny because you would think with that many companions, it would feel like there's just too many cooks in the kitchen. Like there's just too many moving parts to keep track mm-hmm. of. But they did a good job the same way they kind of did with Tenant. Mm-hmm. While you do have these people that are constantly in motion, you only really get them all together for big events. And because they've been fleshed out in other episodes, you don't have to worry about explaining little things about them. Well, and I think something else that helped the whole dynamic was they weren't all there for the Doctor. Amy mm-hmm. was obviously yeah. absolutely there for the Doctor. Rory and the Doctor eventually did become mm-hmm. friends. But Rory was there because of Amy. Yes. Like, if Amy wasn't going, Rora, mm-hmm. Rora, Rory would have stayed behind, mm-hmm. too. Like, he was absolutely there for Amy. And the episode, the first time he died, um, <laughs> and I... They they got me. I thought he was dead. He kind of has a Kenny situation, doesn't he? He does a little bit, yeah. But, like, they totally got me. I thought Rory was dead. Um, the first time he died, was that the crack? Yeah. Yeah. Because then the next, when he came back was the Pandorica. But, yeah, when, mm-hmm. when they did that, I thought that they were just writing him out, honestly. Like, I could see in my head, okay, she started with the fiance Mm -hmm. she had to choose between the two one wanted her to stay one wanted her to travel so they sort of took the decision out of her hand they killed off rory and now she's going to stay with the doctor they were just getting rid of that hurdle i didn't expect him to come back and it took a while for him to come back too well wasn't it like five episodes or, so, or like it, half it, a it was a decent amount yeah. of stuff that you just didn't acknowledge him. Yeah. But I think it's worth mentioning in that episode where he dies through the crack and whatnot. Uh, the doctor is like coaching Amy, who's like on the just barely holding herself together. He's like, yeah. you need to remember him. If you remember him, there's a chance he can come back. Yeah. As long as you keep an image of him in your mind, mm-hmm. there's there's a chance. And then, you know, the TARDIS shakes and they fall down. And the absolutely heartbreaking scene for me is the ring sitting on the ground and Amy hits the ground and she looks up, sees the ring in front of her and she's like, Doctor, what is that? (laughs) She thought the doctor was proposing, yeah. And that sucked. Yeah. Because in that instant, she forgot about Rory. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was like the real killer. That was like the heartbreaker of that whole thing. Because I thought, like you said, I thought he was going to come back. I thought it was going to be one of those things where like Amy just holds on and at the end of the episode he's in the TARDIS. Yeah. No, we didn't get that. <laughs> Did they... Now, we're jumping ahead a few episodes to the first episode of the Pandorica. It was a two-parter, right? The Pandorica? Uh, yeah, because yeah. I think it was the Pandorica opens and then the Big Bang. Yeah. So, in the Pandorica opens, when Rory came back, first of all, him coming back was so casual oh, yeah. and so hilarious that the doctor's just standing there thinking and Rory just walks on and he just starts talking to Rory and is mm-hmm. like breaking down all these things and Rory's just looking at him and nodding. Yeah, yeah, this feels right. And then Smith walks off and Rory just stands there. And then the doctor comes back and he says, Rory, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> that was... Hilarious. Did they ever really explain how he ended up there as a wax android? Y- yes. Because I do not for the life of me remember. It, and I even like that episode now. It's n- <laughs> My tones change. Yes. Give me more explanation. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't so much as explained straight out. Uh, when the doctor was telling Amy, like, when he died the first time, I was like, keep the image in your mind if you remember him. If just remembering can possibly bring things back. Mm-hmm. Uh, all those Romans that were in that, like, area weren't real Romans. They were uh, taken from Amy's memory. The book. Yes. That's right. Okay. And for whatever reason, Rory was just so prominent in her yeah. subconscious yeah. that it like morphed the two together and 
Rory's back. That's right. I remember the book now. The, the like the, mm-hmm. the the Roman yep. Legion picture book from when she was a kid. Mm-hmm. I remember that now. <laughs> Rory, you're dead. Rory, <laughs> yes, doctor. You're dead. Yes, doctor. Ah, <laughs> uh, and then one of Doctor Who's more famous speeches came from the Pandorica opens when he uh, gives his speech in Stonehenge. Which, I gotta say, I think Matt Smith had some really nice speeches. I'm not saying all of them were, were top tier, but I some of the more iconic ones I remember come from Matt Smith and actually Capaldi. I feel like the one in the Pandorica opens in Stonehenge was his weakest one. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not saying it was bad, but like I wouldn't have like picked that as like one of my favorites. I think my top two favorites are obviously um, his end speech. Mm. I'll remember when the doctor was me. Okay. Yeah. And then there was, it was shortly before that one, and it may be just because emotions were running high because we knew it was the mm-hmm. end. Didn't he have one as the old man when he was talking to Clara? And oh, they, yeah. and then Clara did like the That's clock she, strikes 12. Yeah, spoke to the clock, not yeah. the clock. <laughs> <laughs> Spoke to the crack because that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, because it was it was the poem <laughs> yeah. in the cracker in the Christmas cracker about twelve's time is coming or something like that. Yeah. The clock, oh my the god. Clock rings twelve. I, I yeah. completely forgot about the like cracker thing. Yeah. She, because she, because she had to hold his hand and yeah oh, yeah which yeah. was later replicated in the but that's another document. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> We can't jump directly to his death. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't understand how difficult it is, how much we are trying to stay on a normal path. If you had a normal conversation with us, you would be well, amazed at how much we jump topic. You know what? You don't have to have a normal conversation with us. If you watch the previous videos or <laughs> episodes, you'll understand. What? Listen to the first episode again. Yeah. You'll get it. Yes. Okay. Get us up there, guys. <laughs> okay, but the um Yeah, so like those two I feel were some of his strongest ones. Mm. Um He did have some good ones though. The one that I really, really like, it might be one of my favorites. It's the one where he uh I don't even remember the whole full plot of it, but he is with Clara and he has to like talk to the sun thing that's about to like hatch and you have to feed it stories. I don't remember that episode at all. Do you remember Clara and the Leaf? I don't think so. I believe in the We're... modern day Clara era, she like when he found her there was a leaf that was really important for like her life and her mom and whatnot. The episode was about them visiting this, like, station. Oh, like the, the big oak leaf. Yes. Okay, I do remember that now. Yeah, it was blowing down the street or something. Yes. Yeah. And then they go to this place that's having a ceremony where this girl needs to sing. And by the end of it, she ends up singing, you know, the plot happens. But the doctor ends up being by himself facing this, like, giant sun creature thing that's about to hatch out of, like, a literal star and the only way to keep it from hatching is defeat its stories. So the song that they were singing is a story that's supposed to like keep it asleep long enough until the next story and whatnot. But the doctor ends up telling him like everything, like take it, take all the stories, take mm-hmm. all the heartache, take all the secrets that I know, take everything I'm not allowed to talk about anymore. And he's like on his knees crying. Like he hmm. he's by himself, it's just a speech for him. And he's just saying, take it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of knowing all this. I'm tired of Hmm. having to be so careful all the time. And then he takes all of it. And then Clara comes in and she's like, oh, it's not enough. Take this leaf and all the possibilities it could have had. And, you know, Doctor Who logic. Right. No, I don't remember that episode at all. Yeah, very good episode. Okay. Well, back to Amy. (laughs) So when he, Amy and Rory, when they come back, when he comes back in the Pandorica, Mm -hmm. like, I feel like at that point he became a much more integral part Mm -hmm. because in the Big Bang is when they got married, right? 
Yeah. Y yes. Yeah. yeah. The the Big Bang is when they had the wedding because like her parents were alive mm -hmm. again. Which like that whole episode, like the last ten minutes of that whole episode, was an emotional roller coaster in and of itself because she wakes up, mom and dad are alive, she's getting married mm -hmm. to Rory. Rory calls her up and is like, "What's going on?" And she's like, "Mom and dad are alive," and he's like, "Holy cow!" And like he's even like saying, "Do you want to hold off on the wedding?" Like, oh no, he doesn't remember anything. It's just Amy. I thought he remembered too. Oh no, that's right because in yeah. the wedding at the reception, Rory was like, "I don't understand what your problem is. Why are you freaking out?" Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. He didn't remember until the reception. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that is happening. Through various parts of that, of that, like you're just seeing like an image that you mm -hmm. know is River just passing back and forth in the background, mm -hmm. and I can't explain why because like I don't normally get choked up. Like I'm not like I'm emotional, but like I don't like cry at certain things. But like when you get to the wedding, okay, and she gets to the something old, something new, something borrowed, mm -hmm. something blue. And she's yelling, I brought them back, I can bring you back. God, it's happening now. Oh, it, <laughs> I brought them back, I can bring you back too. And then you just hear that grinding and the wind starts blowing. And then that's when Rory says, the doctor. How could we forget mm -hmm. about the doctor? Rory is probably what saved most of us from crying. <laughs> <laughs> because he came out with that yeah. joke at, right the, at the exact right time, yeah. But no, that scene, that that is honestly one of my top Doctor Who scenes yeah. of all. And it's like it's like you said, the entire time that Amy's there, she's just there is an itch in her mind that yeah. she can't figure out, but she keeps going through everything and she's just sitting there with Rory and is like this this isn't right. Yeah. Like this just isn't correct and she has no idea why. And then you're right, she says something uh borrowed something blue, that whole thing, and he shows up and it's like Oh, I knew the doctor wasn't dead, but my <laughs> God, is it good to see him back. And I liked, they were, there were like parts leading up to that mm -hmm. where he was describing the TARDIS. And he said, you know, that old new, he, he mm -hmm. borrowed it, you know, and obviously it's blue. And like, I don't know why, but like it didn't click. Because everybody knows that one. Something mm -hmm. old, something new, something mm -hmm. barred, something blue for a wedding. Like, I don't know why it didn't click until it clicked for Amy. And something else that I really liked about that was that in that five minutes when he showed up and just popped out wearing a tux, that was vindication for her. Because everybody she knew growing up that mm -hmm. said she was nuts, here he is in front of all of them, including her parents. Like So, like, that was, like, Amy's big... I like that was the culmination mm -hmm. of like Amy's storyline quite honestly like that that was the the, the climax of her storyline obviously she stuck around mm -hmm. after that but like I really feel like that was like her payoff and I I think that's why it's so emotional because yeah. it, it was building up to some not that exact scene but mm -hmm. it was building to something that entire time yeah and the doctor wins he saves the day he literally restarts the universe <laughs> and then it's like oh that that could be a way the doctor goes out and do i need to accept that right now and then amy does it and you're like thank god <laughs> and then that led into while wow, he still had her had them with him that led into what is honestly and ironically, I think, my favorite Christmas special. I forget what the actual name of it is, but it's when they do their version of A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. When the, the, the ship that Amy and Rory are stuck on is, like, in that cloud, mm -hmm. and he has to go and, like, convince that dude to, like, let the ship land. Like, that's the other, like, that's my favorite Christmas episode, and it's a Smith episode. <laughs> Oh, no. I know. But it cracks me up because they were in the honeymoon like cabin. Mm. And she comes out in her policeman's uniform. And Rory comes out in the Centurion <laughs> costume. <laughs> uh, everyone's got kinks. Those two together, though, were fantastic. They were. Yeah. And, and like I said, you have that having that many people, you could really just feel like it's a bog. Like the doctor's yeah. not... 
interacting with the companion the way you want them to, but I never felt like that. No. The dynamic between all the characters felt very fluent. Granted, majority of them were a family. <laughs> yes. But for the most part, one, you didn't know that, and two, most of the characters didn't. So, like, it, it felt just very natural to me the way they all interacted with each other, so much to the point that when Amy was like, my boys, you knew exactly who she was talking about. Yeah. Well, and I also liked the relationship that would eventually establish between the Doctor and Rory, like you had mm -hmm. said, because I liked it whenever um, he called Rory, Rory Pond. And Rory said, that's not the way it works. And the Doctor said, yes, it will. And Rory just immediately went, yeah, yeah it will. It will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think, I think we need to address the Van Gogh episode. Oh my gosh. Because, and, and look. What is it with that run? With that, like, Smith, uh, Eleven, Amy, Rory, like, that whole run. There were so many emotional mm -hmm. episodes that I don't think anything since, including the rest of Smith's run, I don't think anything since hit the emotions as much as his first arc his mm -hmm. first half did because that's yeah talk about van gogh oh my god and <laughs> this one uh, ruins me Th this one absolutely ruins me obviously me and rob like this episode but <laughs> in, ca in case you couldn't tell from the subtle context <laughs> clues <laughs> but as it comes to the fandom itself or as a whole this is a very like cherished episode out picked from the rest like this is a very liked and very held episode and, and the, for good reason the dude they got to play vincent oh yeah oh man i forget who he is he's been in other things that we've yeah seen, but... i i don't know his name yeah but and and what's so funny is the actual plot to the episode isn't that important it's just a monster episode yeah that's the thing that like the monster is not even really that interesting it's just invisible yeah it's an invisible chicken. Mm -hmm. But because Van Gogh was just not right and able to see him, and what, I'm saying not right in the sense of at the time he just had mental issues and no one understood how that crap worked. Yeah. But you have Amy and Van Gogh give this, like, if, if Rory didn't exist, this was definitely number two. <laughs> uh, their relationship was just so pure and wholesome on both parts like they had nothing but admiration for each other and vincent just fell in love with amy mm -hmm. and the most heartbreaking part as and this is real life spoilers guys uh van gogh did not have a good life no no uh, he did not. he had a horrendous life both because of his mental issues and because of like his family and the world around him so much to the point, infamously, that he cut his own ear off. They didn't know how to handle it back then. Mm -hmm. And so, knowing all of that, he's still, that's still the Van Gogh you get in this episode. But what it really boils down to is as the Doctor and Amy, you know, are with Vincent and solving this mystery and proving to him that he's not insane, or at least not as insane as he thinks he is. Tony Curran. Tony Curran, that's who played Vincent. He was also in, um, he was in Daredevil, the series, the second season. He was Finn the villain. Cooley. Yeah. yeah. He was Finn Cooley in Daredevil, and he was Boar in Thor The Dark World. So, wow. there you go. Nice. A scholar actor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you get to the end, and honestly... I think part of why it stands out so much is the Doctor full-on breaks one of his own rules to do what he does for Vincent. When he takes him into the future. Yeah. yeah. Because he doesn't... Like, uh, the companions are different. He travels with them, obviously. But for one-off characters, you don't typically have them travel somewhere else for no real reason if it's not a part of the plot. Mm -hmm. But... And I don't remember if it was Amy asking him or if the Doctor just decided... But, oh no, the doctor totally just decided. The, doc the doctor um, pretty much uh, <laughs> said, hey, come with me, and took him on to the TARDIS. 
And one of the things that I think is amusing, and it kind of leads to Vincent's state of mind at the time, I don't remember him really reacting when he walked into the TARDIS for the first time. Did he? He reacted, but he had such a soft reaction because yeah. it wasn't like, oh my God, it's huge. It's he bigger on the in inside. Yeah. And he was like, this is beautiful. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. He, he appreciated the beauty of the art of mm -hmm. what it was on the outside versus the inside that like he wasn't mind blown like people usually are when they see that and have to cope with the whole bigger on the inside thing. And then he celebrated it. Yeah. And then you bring him to the future to an art exhibit that has all of his artwork, obviously much farther into the future. And as you all know, because you in fact live in the future from Vincent Van Gogh, uh, <laughs> his, <laughs> his artwork is world renowned. Like, like they describe in the episode to take his own pain and turn it into ecstasy of life. Like yeah. it, his artwork is beautiful. And Bill Nye delivering that, mm -hmm. that speech like the 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 emotion and the passion that he put into it like i can't help but think that like bill nye is actually like an like a a fan or like you know a lover of van gogh's work just it's because it's such a small part too yeah and he just kills it because like in the beginning of the episode he's the curator yeah. but like you know he's on it for like maybe two minutes or something you genuinely think it's a cameo like this yeah. dude probably like doctor who he got a spot cool yeah and then you come back to him and he's delivering that speech that like, even if Van Gogh wasn't standing there, you would still be like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and if you haven't seen the episode or don't remember it, uh, they walk in and the oh, doctor- please. If you've seen it, you remember it. <laughs> Very true. Uh, but the doctor asks the curator, you know, what do you think of Van Gogh? Mm -hmm. A question along those lines. Yeah. And so he goes into the speech about, you know, what Van Gogh is and what he means and what he did with artwork. And for v Vincent to hear these words in, a, in his life that he literally never got just wrecks you, man. Yes. Like it, it's all in a good way. Like, I, I can't stress that enough. You are ugly crying for a good reason. And when he hugs the curator and they leave, I kind of like that the curator had that question that like he was open to the idea of, was that just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or at least a descendant of, you know what I mean? Like, I like that they gave the curator that little, mm. that little bit right in there. But like, yeah, Bill and I just like killed it. Like, you know who that is, right? Mm -hmm. He was uh, David Jones. Yeah, okay. Not a lot of people realize that that was him underneath all of that immaculate CGI um, when he was Davy Jones. But yeah, like, just crushed that whole speech. And this leads to, okay, this might be another one of my top Smith speeches, the pile of good and the pile of bad speech that he gave Amy when they realized Van Gogh still still did what he did the like the good doesn't always outweigh the bad but the bad doesn't always outweigh the good yeah that like it all depends like you just have to make sure that your mm -hmm. pot that the pot that the good pile is bigger than the bad pile at the end and it was like i really look because that was heartfelt and he was it was very nurturing i just like it wasn't as long mm -hmm. as some of his speeches were but like the reason for the delivery of like when he was like basically tending to Amy, I, I liked the emotion behind mm. it. Because he, the way that Smith played it was, you very much got the idea that he was making it up off the cuff, mm -hmm. but he still meant everything that he said. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with Matt Smith a lot of the times, is on the surface level, he is very childlike. He, mm -hmm. he, uh, he is, he doesn't seem like he's taking anything seriously. It doesn't seem like what he's saying holds much weight or merit right but then you go back and you like actually listen to what he's saying you're looking at his body language and everything else that he does and you realize that this guy is just strictly putting up a facade yes because matt smith's doctor is the doctor who ran and is the doctor who stopped running mm -hmm. which is why peter had the whole arc he had that we're not going to get into yet <laughs> But it, it really does start with Matt Smith's doctor and him just accepting that he can't 
keep running from everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I don't know if this is a, if you would call this a fan theory or fans figured this out or they just put this put this out there. Um, or did they even talk about this in the day of the doctor that like from Eccleston to Tennant mm. to Smith, even though all those guys are basically the same, mm. like emotionally and maturity wise, like the doctor kept getting younger and younger. Mm -hmm. Like he was trying to go back to the beginning, trying to get away from the thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And I, and I do think that like the, that plays into, and this may even be what you were, um, what you were alluding to or what you were talking about, that like, that's part of like the running, like he's trying to become like mm -hmm. this, this childish, innocent doctor again, but he has very much read in his ledger mm -hmm. and like, he's trying to avoid that. Whereas like 10 may have been trying to distance himself from mm -hmm. that, but like he still faced it and he still succumbed to those moments of darkness, like what we talked about in the last episode. Up until his death. Up until his death. Because then he started running. Yes. But but then um, Smith was totally trying to, or like Eleven mm. was like totally trying to like just not be that guy anymore. Because with the exception of maybe the Pandorica, and even I don't think the Pandorica and the Big Bang fall into this, I never felt like the stakes in Eleven's story arcs were as high as Ten's. I, I think part of that had to do with Eleven had a lot of Doctor-centric plot lines. Mm -hmm. Like the whole Doctor Who thing, saying his name. You got the impression that if he says it, something bad will happen, but because you know, given the show's title... Yeah. We're not going to know this name. <laughs> it, it, it did lose a little bit of urgency about it. Yeah. But like, yeah, Pandorica, that was the whole universal restart thing. Mm -hmm. But everything else was, was more either companion-centric or the doctor-centric. And I think part of the reason that that was, at least for me, is that while there were Daleks and Cybermen in... Eleven's stories, mm -hmm. they never were the driving antagonist like they were for Ten's run. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, there was, like, that whole Dalek-Cyberman war going on at that one point, mm -hmm. you know, and then they had to, like, suck them all in, and then he lost Rose, and, like, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, and then the Daleks, like, were stealing planets <laughs> to create a big universe mm -hmm. bomb, and it's, like, stuff like that... <laughs> Never really happened in Elevens, I don't think. Even when you get to the end at Trenzalore, I don't feel like the stakes were nearly as high universally. For him, yes, but yes. not like not like if I lose here, there's going to be massive mm -hmm. repercussions across time and space. <laughs> so, <laughs> shall we move on to... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Before we move on to that... We're talking speeches. We're talking Pandorica. Outside of Doctor Who, although this is from Doctor Who, one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I say this to anyone I give advice to, uh, is when Matt Smith is dying at the end of the Pandorica uh, arc, you know, before he's borrowed and blue and back, uh, <laughs> he is talking to Amy as he's, like, going back through his life, and he's talking to uh, Amelia, the little the girl, mm -hmm. and he says that we're all stories in the end, so mm. why not make yeah. it a good one? And that is my all-time favorite quote. Like, I love that sentiment so much that I actively think about that, that phrase almost every day. See, I like that, but for me, it became very meme-ish because for a long time... There were so many YouTubers mm -hmm. that were using that as their sign off. And I was like, look, I know you're trying to be like poignant and like deep, but mm -hmm. you didn't come up with that. Come up with something else. Everyone and their mother is using that mm -hmm. to sign off. <laughs> like I, I didn't have a problem with the phrase or, the, mm -hmm. or the, the, the sentiment behind it. I just had a problem that like everybody was stealing yeah. it. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> I'm kind of happy now that it kind of has faded out. Yeah, yeah. And now when I bring it up, people are usually like, oh, what's that from? And I'm like, the TV show. But that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> 
So while we are talking about Rory and Amy, or sorry, Amy and Rory, we yeah, have on. to come up to the end of their run with the Doctor. And this is actually one of my least liked episodes out of the entire show. And I, I, I have to give him credit on his one criticism of this episode. It straight up doesn't make sense. And it's the angel that's in Manhattan. The Statue of Liberty. Like, come on. The concept, while cool, to see the Statue of Liberty as a weeping angel and the fact that it stuck there because New York City has a lot of people, believe it or not. Uh, how does it move? Straight how, up. How did it get to the hotel? How, how did that giant thing move at all? Because New Yorkers aren't just dead at night. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lively city. <laughs> So, some might say it's the city that never sleeps. Mm. I, I couldn't stand that. I couldn't stand the Statue of Liberty being a weeping angel. I couldn't stand the made-up paradox that they had. Because it was like, well, if we go back in time, you know, it'll create another paradox. We won't be able to save you and Rory. And I'm like, well, you could, like, go back in time into Pennsylvania and then just drive across the border, like... Or go back a day earlier. Cars exist. Wait a day. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> like, th there were a lot of ways around the plot. But the scene at the end where we actually lose Amy and Rory, specifically Amy, hurts. Yeah, because Rory's you're not ready for. You mm -hmm. just see that the tombstone has his name on it. And you know something's up at that point. You don't even realize weeping angels are on mm. the scene until Rory disappears. And the one angel is standing there with her finger out. And then, like, Amy starts having the freak out. And River and the doctor come up behind her. And the doctor just <laughs> fully Begging. does not accept what's about to happen. Like, he knows Rory is gone. He knows Amy isn't going to let him be alone. Yeah. And he is begging with every fiber of his being for her to not go because he doesn't want to be alone. And I feel like that the reason that, like, this all happened, it goes... Like, you mentioned that, like, you know, you find out later that they were all related. Like, the doctor had his family. Mm -hmm. Like, between River, which we haven't talked about yet, um, River, Rory, Amy their relationship, their dynamic. Like, he had a family mm -hmm. at that point. And now, in one fell swoop, he was going to lose, like, two-thirds of them. And they weren't coming back. So when he knew Amy was going to leave, of course he starts breaking down. Like, I think he, he like, he even got to tears. He did. And yep. River was crying. And Amy, who at this point knows... That's her daughter. Mm -hmm. Like, when he when she says, you be a good girl and you take care of him, it's like she's already made up her mm -hmm. mind. And everybody knows she's made up her mind. And the last words, raggedy man, goodbye. Oh. <laughs> and then a semi-transition into our girl River. Uh, that scene... If you want to understand River's character, you can watch that scene because she just watched her dad, followed by her mom, essentially die to her. Yeah. And instead of breaking down, instead of having the emotions that she should be having, she forces herself to stay mostly composed so that the doctor can break down. And, and she's still staring mm -hmm. at the angel, yeah. Like tears going down her face and she can't even blink. Mm-hmm. Like, that, that is the epitome of River to me. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, what, that scene happened, and I understood her character from point A to point B, which is not a straight line with her. No, and I, I, do, I do like that getting rid of, or, or writing out Rory and Amy, I do like that it was, it was, it was fast. Mm -hmm. It was very abrupt. It wasn't like a lot of the other companions where it was... I I can't do this anymore, mm -hmm. or I have something else going on, or they, like, even with Donna, where they, like, did the mind wipe, mm -hmm. like, I don't think that, while that was heartbreaking, was nearly as mm -hmm. heated 
emotionally as this was because there was no build up to mm-hmm. it. Like it just happened. <laughs> like I think the only thing you would have known going into it is that it was their last episode casting wise. So you knew what was happening. But if if you weren't there when that episode aired Mm-mm. and you just are watching it, no, that, that was me. Yeah, remember, it just I did comes up on you. Yeah, remember, like I pretty much mm-hmm. sat out the entire run, um, and I didn't realize that was that was the end. That that was it for them. So, like, even I'm sitting there going, no, 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 uh. <laughs> But I didn't like that episode. And I think that was another thing, another reason. Because, like, I was sitting there and I was like, this is a stupid, stupid episode. I love the Weeping Angels, mm-hmm. but I thought they were used very poorly. They were. Um, I... I think it was the right monster to take them out. Because they were there in the first episode. And it absolutely terrified Amy. Oh, yeah. Through the, through the monitor. Through yeah. the screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess it wasn't the Weeping Angels' first episode. No, but it was... They were a presence for a lot mm-hmm. of Smith. Smith's first run. When, after Amy and Rory left and were, te- were written out, they would show up again, but never as the menace mm-hmm. that they were for the first half. I think it wasn't <laughs> legitimately until the town called Christmas mm-hmm. that they came back as an actual threat but it it was kind of weird because they weren't none of them were fully formed yeah they weren't they weren't the main antagonist they were just like an obstacle Mm -hmm. to get around to get to christmas which i mean i thought was interesting because that's kind of terrifying if i was in that situation (laughs) but it was not don't blink but after Amy and Rory's death and the heartbreak of that scene with River... They didn't die. They were just thrown back in time. If we never see them again, they're dead to us, all right? Well, I guess they did have the tombstones. Yeah, exactly. Wait, did they have the tombstones? Yeah, they had the because tombstones. That because was, that was the last shot as the camera panning down and it said Amy. Okay, okay. Uh, but after that emotional confrontation with everyone and the weeping angels uh the doctor does not handle this well believe it or not the found family this man had was almost all but taken away and the one person left was arguably the one who was around the least and river even mentioned throughout that episode through numerous times he doesn't like endings Mm -hmm. the doctor doesn't like endings and that's very true Mm mm-hmm and like hide the wrinkles, hide the fact that you're aging. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, that was the end of an era. And, yeah, he did not react well to it. So much to the point that my man straight up went into hiding. Like, the doctor had enough and mm-hmm. was like, you know what? I'm going to go somewhere where there's no technology And no one's going to talk to me in my cloud. And that is where we are ending today. There was a lot going on with Elevens. Me and Uncle Britt talked about this, that it seems like with Ten, with Tenant, with um, Davies running the show, it was very much more of like a Mm plot-driven story arc for the Doctor. That, like I said, there were high stakes... And the show just kept moving forward, moving forward. That there wasn't a whole lot going on with Mm -hmm. the companions. And there wasn't a whole lot of, like, side issues either. But there is with Smith when Moffat was running. That, like, he really got into the interpersonal Mm -hmm. relationships of the companions and the Doctor. And all of their little side bits, including like, the main plot of the episode. Like, there was always something Mm -hmm. going on. It kind of goes with what you've been saying about Smith and his TARDIS, that, like, it's chaos. There's Mm -hmm. always something happening. Oh, speaking of chaos, one thing we got to talk about just briefly before we sign off, which we almost forgot, the Doctor's wife. Mm. Just real brief synopsis, the TARDIS comes to life in female form, and it was fantastic, 
It was hilarious. It was heartbreaking, like much of this run was. It, yeah, they, I don't know the name of the actress they got to play the TARDIS in human form, but she was phenomenal. Yeah. She was funny, heartfelt, yeah. the whole nine. But, again, the plot of the episode is kind of indifferent towards what you really got, which was the TARDIS is alive. The Doctor is going to interact with the TARDIS, arguably his truest love. But... And they're fighting a planet, mm -hmm. like a planet that like just eats Time Lords, mm -hmm. which also led to one of my absolute favorite lines of the entire series, which we'll get to when we're done talking about this. But go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about her some more. No, when they when they drained the the energy of the TARDIS, when this mm -hmm. planet and the planet's helpers drained the energy of the TARDIS and put the essence of the TARDIS into the body of this dead human mm -hmm. female and she became like Franken Tardis. Like for never having been on the show before, like she really sold the fact that she knew mm -hmm. the doctor better than anybody else. And like just the way that she was first talking, that like she was talking in the way that like you would think the Tardis would communicate, you know, when you stole mm -hmm. me, you know, there's my boy, there's my thief. Things like that. I was like, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant the way that they're writing this. And it, it truly felt like the TARDIS, which yeah. I have to admit, if you came at me with just the plan for that episode, I'd probably be like, you might not want to do that. Yeah. Like, if you do this poorly, people it, are going to look at it and be like, yeah, I mean, I guess technically that's the TARDIS, but... It really could have ruined the mm -hmm. whole relationship because, like, the Doctor, not just Smith, but I feel like Tennant, too, mm -hmm. had referred to the TARDIS as a she at mm -hmm. various points. And, like, the, they spoke to the TARDIS, not like we talk to our cars. Mm -hmm. Like, they spoke to the TARDIS with the understanding that, like, the TARDIS understands what they're saying. And this could have completely ruined that whole illusion and everything, but it really did just reinforce mm -hmm. the whole thing. And I love when he finally accepts it and he takes the TARDIS to Amy and Rory and says, this is the TARDIS. And Amy says, that's the TARDIS in her. Yes, that's the TARDIS. And she's a girl. And Amy, Amy just pauses and says, did you wish really hard? <laughs> Which... Is not outside the realm of possibility that that's what happened <laughs> it's in a, Doctor Who. Yeah, it's, it's a real <laughs> fear. <laughs> the Doctor got a little lonely on his last trip. <laughs> oh, man. But when she had to go back... Yeah. Dude, that... That was like a necessary evil that the entire time I didn't want to happen. Well, because the body was dying, right? Like, well, the body was dying. Yeah. Obviously, we needed the TARDIS, not Back in the, the TARDIS. human TARDIS. Oh, did you know, remember that TARDIS that he built from scrap mm -hmm. and then she powered it just mm -hmm. so that they could get back to the, the, the real yeah. TARDIS? Did you hear the story about that TARDIS? Where they came up with it? Where they got it from? Wasn't it like old sets that no. they just reused? No, 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 no. They had a contest for school students design a TARDIS control panel. And the winner they made into that set piece for that episode. That's dope. So, like, that control mm -hmm. panel, because that's all it really was, mm -hmm. was, like, a control panel and, like, a small platform. That control panel was designed by, like, I think it was, like, like some 12-year-old student. That's cool. Yeah. That's why, like, it was literally put together mm -hmm. with, like, a horn and alarm clock. You know what I mean? It's like the kid was just looking around and... But it works, it especially does. with Matt. It does. No, absolutely it does. And yeah, no, that was really cool. I really liked it for that episode. But my favorite line of the series comes from this episode when he brings the TARDIS, her, back into the TARDIS, it, when the planet entity mm -hmm. is trying to inhabit the box. And he says, you should fear me. I've killed hundreds of Time Lords. And Smith says, fear me, I've killed them all. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, dude! Yeah. Dude! Yeah. <laughs> because... I was like, that's a flex, man. Yeah. <laughs> <That> is... <laughs> it's a flex, and 
one of the most depressing things he keeps saying. <laughs> yeah. Fear me, I've killed them all. And then, like, when the body died and the entity of the TARDIS was just released and it just, like, went back home and he's yelling at this thing, you locked her. Wasn't that, like, basically, like, the Doctor Who version of we're not locked in here with you, you're locked in here with her? <laughs> Because didn't it start with the guy, the he, he was a short guy, and he was like a Time Lord, but a Time Lord for sleep or something, and they got stuck in the TARDIS? Is that how they got to that planet, or is that a different plot altogether? I think it's a different plot altogether. I honestly, I think they were responding to a Time Lord distress beacon, is what brought them to that, would make that planet. And then there were, like, the two patchwork mm -hmm. creatures that the planet had been, like, piecing mm -hmm. together. And then when they found the distress beacon, that's when the doctor was like, oh, this is wrong. Because he realized what had been happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want her to go. No, no. But that was awesome. She was awesome. And then, like, her last lines, like, I just wanted to say hello. It's like, oh, oh. Because there is nothing more you needed to do with their relationship than what they did in that episode. Yeah. Because... They finally got to talk. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's Like, they didn't need to talk about anything. They just needed to talk to each other. Yeah. And that's all you wanted. So, to her last line of just, I wanted to say hello. Yeah. that That's all I needed from that. Because, and, like, the way she was describing it when she was trying to think of the word where she was saying it's so small but so big and sad, and it's just like... <sighs> no one will ever understand the Doctor the way the TARDIS understands the Doctor. Right. So everything she says in this episode, even if it's funny, is just laced with bitterness. <laughs> All right. And that, I think is our end for this episode. Next episode, we will talk about the second half of Matt Smith's run. New TARDIS, new outfit, new companion, a new cloud. <laughs> the cloud, yeah, the cloud <laughs> that came out of nowhere. But more importantly for me, anyway, because like these guys should have had their own spin-off series, The London Underground. The lizard lady? Oh! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they ended up being what Peter... Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They were really cool. Because you saw them, and we'll talk about their intro, like mm -hmm. you saw them before this, mm -hmm. but this is when they really became... Established. Yeah. So, thank you for listening. You can find me at Brick and Tire on Instagram and YouTube. You can find me at Uncle underscore Brit on Instagram and TikTok. The next episode of this series, we'll be talking about the rest of the Smith run. So until then, this has been Ralph World. Ralph World.